You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the Double Edge Double Bill. This week, any given Sunday, is good for Jim Cotta. Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariano who come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. I am Adam. Adam Thomas. I make the people want to vomit. And I am Thomas Mariani, who has trained vigorously to be a gymnast. I'm ready to compete. I'm ready to do this. Oh! Oh no, an arrow to the back! Who could have seen that here in Parmistan? Oh, oh that's oh, their no. biggest export. That's the leading cause of death for people in Parmistan is arrow to the torso. <laughs> yep. <laughs> On oh. a rope bridge. On <laughs> a rope bridge. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, welcome everyone to the Double Edge Double Bill, where every week Adam and I cover a randomly selected yin and yang related to whatever topic we're doing. And uh, this time we decide, you know, um, that King Richard movie is coming out. Uh, which was, you know, whatever. It's Will Smith playing the father of the person we would want a whole movie devoted to, basically. That I heard this was announced. I'm like, why would I care about this? Even if it's Will Smith, I'd, I'd rather just see Vanessa Williams <laughs> fucking tennis movie. But regardless, we decided it was high time to come back to a topic we did quite a while ago. Uh, we are returning to the world of sports movies, which we haven't done since the first episode we did this for was back around when Creed Two was coming out. And so, we've said before on that episode and other places, despite not being sports fans, we're pretty big fans of a good sports movie, right? We, we both are in that camp. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of compelling ways to tell drama and action, excitement, any, any really way you want to do it. Right. So, that made me think, hmm, well, since Creed Two, how many, like, sports movies have there been? And, because I noticed this even before we did our last episode, that sports movies aren't as common anymore. And it was shocking to me to find out that amongst, like, majorly released ones, there are only three I could figure. Do you have any Um, guesses as to what those three might be? I can give uh, you some hints. Uh, yeah, alright, let's do that. Okay. some hints. I'll I'll give you three hints. One, they are all related to the same sport. So all three movies are about the one same sport. Two, one of them came out earlier this year. Three, I know you've seen that movie because we've talked about it previously. The one that came out earlier this year, I've yes, seen? Yes, you have seen that one. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, I'll unravel one layer of this. They're all about basketball. Oh, fuck me. All right. So, obviously, Space Jam 2 is the one we're talking about. Right, yes. Uh, and the other two, two came out within, like, 2021, came out within 2019. I have no fucking clue. What were the other two basketball movies? The other two were High Flying Bird, which was the Steven Soderbergh movie, the Netflix movie. And the other one was The Way Back, the Ben Affleck movie. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, which I still haven't seen either. Pretty good. I would All say. right. It's a pretty solid, like, uh, sort of addiction movie surrounded by basketball. But yes, isn't that so bizarre that there have been only, like, three of those in the last, like, three years, basically, since we last did that episode? I mean, it is, but also given, you know, sort of what's been going on in the world and stuff, not not extremely bizarre, because you got to figure sports movies typically lend themselves to giant casts and everything, too. So they're not really small movies in per se, as far as uh, bodies on set. Well, at least is it weird that, like, the only three that came out were only about basketball anyway? Because you figured there would have been other stuff. Yeah, that's a little weird, but you got to figure, too. The sort of heyday for the sports movies really started dying out, I would say, in like early, mid-90s. I mean, yeah, we still got them, but they were all basically the same after a while. It wasn't focused necessarily on the sport itself more than like whoever the coach was. And uh, that's kind of the way it went for a while. What bookends the heyday of the sports movie is between the first Rocky and then Rocky Balboa. In between, you got so many different sports movies that were either 
playing on the Rocky formula or doing something a bit different. There are plenty of other sports movies before the original Rocky. But at the same time, yeah, it's really diluted. And I think part of it is weirdly very relevant to one of the movies we're talking about today because I think, like, sports has become its own sort of, like, big corporatized thing in a different way than even movies are. Both have become corporatized, but in such divergent ways, I don't think both could be, like, really as compatible as they used to be because there's so much more, like, vested interest from various different, like, big hands of like overlord corporations basically that would have too many notes too many things to the point where both would be like why the fuck are we even bothering who cares yeah and just the overhead too depending on how what type of movie you want to make has got to be insane it's got to be incredible for to pay for the rights and the likenesses or even the logos or anything like that it's got to be crazy yeah they would all just turn into say a giant commercial maybe like that space jam 2 movie we were talking about yeah a, a commercial for Warner brothers right a commercial for a movie from the 90s that was already based on a fucking series of commercials. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. almost as if culture is eating itself crazy. Anyway, we're here to talk about sports movies. Yeah, pseudo. Sports. Yeah, sports. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fun. And uh, we're talking about two very different movies. And even the last time we did sports, it was with The Natural. Um, and the other one was Rocky V, of course. So we have a boxing movie and a baseball movie. And here we're doing um, a football movie. And a gymnastics movie, which is at least yeah. how we can fairly categorize that yeah. one movie, which we'll talk about in a moment. But basically, if you're new, we pick a random double feature at the end of every episode. So at the end of the last episode, we ended up between Adam's two good picks, which ultimately got us to any given Sunday. And then uh, between my two bad picks, which ultimately got us to Jim Cotta. Oh, Jim Cotta. We have so much to talk about. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, do we? We do, but we don't. That's the problem with Jim Cotta. We'll it's, get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that, yes. But first, let's do Any Given Sunday. When a sport... Let's do it! Come on! I need you to lead this team. ...is run by corporations. I am not re-signing a 39-year-old quarterback, no matter how great he was. The Ooh. economics I, just don't work. I coach my way. When the players... <laughs> they got four years to make their million bucks, and that's it. ...are corrupted by wealth and fame. It's a short life, but it's a goddamn glorious one. <laughs> It's about the money. Football is a corporation. He may sell a lot of t-shirts, this kid, but he's tearing his team apart. How did you hold it together? Al Pacino, Cameron Diaz, Dennis Quaid, James Woods, Jamie Foxx, and LL Cool J. Any given Sunday. So Any Given Sunday came out December 22nd, 1999, one of the last films of the 20th century. Kind of fitting from director Oliver Stone, who we haven't talked about in a while, since uh, we talked about Platoon a while ago. Um, and this is written by him and John Logan, based on the novel of the same name by Pat Toomey, though to be fair, uh, there's a lot of different drafts. Apparently this was based on like amalgamation of various different scripts. That's why if you look in the credits, there's a lot of, like, based on this story by this other writer and this person. It's an amalgamation of a lot of things. And basically, it's the story about a uh, football team in uh, not the NFL, uh, but the AFFA. Because uh, for a lot of reasons, this movie would not be uh, sponsored by the NFL. Because it's a very satirical movie about, like, football as a business, basically. It follows, basically, this team who are the Miami Sharks who are playing within the AFFA that are coached by um, the Anthony D'Amato coach character played by Al Pacino. And it's about him kind of like wrestling with the corporate interests of sports and also his team, which has a lot of people, including a hotshot that is like sort of the um, beloved uh, member of any team at this point, like sort of the star of this football season played by Jamie Foxx and a lot of things. And Adam, this was your choice. Uh, so why any given Sunday? As we've said, I'm not necessarily a big sports guy. Like, I know about football. I know the basics of it. I know who all the big players are, the big teams, stuff like that. Like, I'm not completely oblivious. But this was kind of a take on it I never even thought thought about. Like, as far as the internal struggles with management against owners and even ticket sales and passing of the torch and injuries and fake medical reports 
and all this stuff that you you know if you do just five minutes of research you're like oh no this shit always happens it happens all the time where people are cleared to sort of play when they they really shouldn't be and just the constant power struggle between team captain and other team members or team captain and coach or defensive coach and coach and offensive coordinator and just all this internal politics and everything that, that's why i sort of you know really love this movie because yes it's about football but you could easily sort of set the backdrop of really almost any sport to this or even sort of like an upstart hotshot company and it would still sort of apply like it's just it's a really really interesting take on corporate greed and monetization and sort of using people as objects just it happens to be set against football yeah i mean i don't know if as many like big upstart companies would have the issue of people having concussions i mean that might be the more specific <laughs> well, yeah, 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 football yeah, yeah. and shit like that though for the record that was interesting for me just coming from the perspective of i hadn't seen this movie before i'd heard about it i just heard a lot of things about like oh yeah it's oliver stone late 90s football movie and it was so fascinating going back to this because it feels like such a prescient movie with particularly like talking about corporate sponsorship and then also the concussion element of it all. Like, that feels like something that most of what I was sort of aware of of football in recent years in particular was just people being far more critical of, like, hey, you know, uh, we get, let these guys go out there and just beat each other up. Uh, shockingly, a lot of them die horribly from, like, head injury-related pain from that, from previous injuries. Yeah, that CTE. CTE. Yes, right. Yeah. CTE. Um, that really hurts a lot of people. And I think it's it's fascinating watching this movie that came out in 99, and like I said, was very much not endorsed by the NFL um, because of how critical it was. Because it's this big sort of studio movie, at least at the time, that is willing to like go full on against the glitz and glamour of sports of this particular era. And it's, it's really fascinating, especially because um, it's a movie that I feel like a lot of people could attempt to make, but... It works so perfectly for Oliver Stone because only a guy who allegedly makes movies that feel like they're on cocaine could do a movie like this. Right, allegedly is a good word. Um, yes, a, a legally good word to use, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with you. And it, just the fact that, I mean, you have to admit, your first time seeing this and everything, but the cast of this movie is so fucking stacked. Um, no, yeah, I I completely agree with that because especially like within the first few minutes, we're introduced to like not just Pacino, who I knew, and I believe I knew Jamie Foxx was in there, but also uh, Cameron Diaz. I didn't had no idea it was gonna be like the owner of Dennis Quaid, LL Cool J, and Margaret. Uh, like just Jim yeah. Brown. Jim Brown makes the most sense to be fair because he's obviously post. Sure, uh, but he, Lawrence he, Taylor as well. Right, who I was not aware of was even a football player, but I thought was really impressive. Like they, those two were actually of this big, huge cast. They were the ones that impressed me the most because they feel like they're the ones that are dealing with kind of like a lot of the themes of this movie in particular. Where there's a great scene where him and Al Pacino are talking, Jim Brown and Al Pacino are talking, and it's just this whole thing about like I don't know, man. I just I hate being a part of like this big fucking corporate gig. I didn't sign up for this shit. I just wanted to have people play football. And Jim Brown was like, "That's why I want to move to you know teaching high school football. Kids just want to fucking play." They don't want to, like, go into all this other bullshit. It's about a lot more pure. It's just like, that comes from somebody who has been directly involved with the politics and bullshit of football besides actually playing. Oh, right, 100%. And how perfect of a casting for the smarmy doctor and, the, like, the do-good doctor. James Woods against Matthew Modine. You're like, oh, yeah, this works perfect. Adam, are you saying that James Woods is really good at playing dudes who kind of are shady and are willing to push their own self-interest in front of the health and safety of others. I am, and that just goes to show his range as an actor. I know, yeah. Allegedly, he's maybe Alleged not the best guy. Allegedly. 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 Satire, parody, Allegedly. Mr. Woods, don't Allegedly. sue us, please. Anyway, yeah, no, I, I thought that was phenomenal oh. casting as well. And even, like, Aaron Eckhart is the one guy who's kind of like, he's sort of like the assistant coach. Yeah, he's the offensive coordinator. Right, or even, no, but my favorite, who had been in previously a couple of uh, stone movies john c mcginley is the asshole sports reporter yes. perfect. such a good cast especially the interview he has with jamie fox where jamie fox is just laying on like the truths about football and there's just a the point where he tries to move on just like oh uh, so yeah you got for yourself and get some bunch of defensive things don't you next time in the next game <laughs> like he can't handle him just completely dismantling professional football <laughs> and what a perfect choice to like give him this really weasley haircut to where it's like 
real camped on one side, but too long on the other. Yes. And he's constantly munching on this cigar. It's just like, you could tell he, he wants to be like a sports gotcha journalist, but like you said, he doesn't know how to handle the big stories when they come. I mean, even to the point to where Pacino pushes him into it, you know, and he's like, he demands an apology. Well, no, but, no, but even like he gets up, he's like, oh, that's great. That's just yeah. great. <laughs> No, yep. uh, really good. And and even like all, so many other people, interesting, I had no idea if fucking Elizabeth Berkeley showed up at this movie. Like, oh, wow, is this like the one thing she did post Showgirls? That's interesting. And she's good at it. She's better in that five seconds than she is in all of Showgirls. I don't know. There was a point where she was with Al Pacino and it's just like, I don't know. We're not connected, Al. We're in different places. <laughs> yeah. But then you get like James Karen, who is perfect. Yes. As a sort of easily guy. But dude, you know, hats off. I'm usually not a fan of hers. But Cameron Diaz is really good in this movie. 99 was such a good year for her between this and being John Malkovich. It really showed off her potential. And I think the thing is, we all undervalued Cameron Diaz to a certain degree when she was actually making movies. I think ever since she sort of retired in the last couple of years from doing movies, I look back at like her career and it's like, oh no, I don't think it was the case if she was like any less talented of an actress. I think it's just more a case of like we either miscast or put her in smaller roles. Like I get why by the end of her career where she's like in Green Hornet and Annie, she's like, yeah, I'm probably bailing because nobody gives a shit about her anymore. Because like she's a really fun presence in some of those earlier movies like The Mask or There's Something About Mary or in this movie and like I said, being John Malkovich. I think she was a much more talented actress than we give her credit for. No, I agree. Unfortunately, she was a book, you know, probably post- Really post this movie, she started just getting kind of booked on her looks alone. Which I think is which is an interesting part of why I think this works so well. Because it's so much about her being like undervalued. It's just like, oh, you took this over because your daddy died and he left it to you. And you. I think that she's playing a lot into that, which is like general Hollywood sexism into sexism within just like managers. Particularly the scene that she, where she's going back and forth with Charlton Heston once again, another weird like person who's just been this movie a uh, briefly as the big commissioner and he leaves just like oh god she would eat her young i swear just like yep this is about how i figured it would go between these two yes they do play up on that she's attractive and everything in this movie like all the sports players are into her even jamie fox is hitting on her and stuff that's almost like a tool in her arsenal in this performance where what i was trying to say really like with charlie's angels and stuff they didn't really give her anything else but be the eye candy it sort of felt like, but you'd be the ditzy one and everything. And this one, she's got a lot. Of, she's like an onion. Uh, oh, I get it, because she was in that one movie, yeah. Shrek 2. No, 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 Shrek Happily After After. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, right, the, the Forever yeah, After, the, the true masterpiece of the, the Shrek quadrilogy. I'm sorry. Um, yes. But I think another person who gets kind of undervalued as an actor in general is like a Jamie Foxx, who I think that's a lot more on him, admittingly, because he tends to kind of just take anything. But when you see him act like in this movie or like collateral or other stuff like that, it's like, no, you are a great commanding presence. And it's kind of a bummer that he just kind of like really went out early on like Ray. And he's only shown that kind of talent a few times in the last few years. And now it's just like, I'll be on the Shazam game show. I'll host that. It's like, Jamie, you're better than this. What (laughs) What are you doing? (laughs) He's great in this, dude. Yeah. He's absolutely fantastic. Like electric in this movie. And the way his his personality shifts and stuff, you see that all the time in sports with young players or something like that, or guys who, let's put it this way, he's basically how Cuba Gooding Jr. is in Jerry Maguire at the end, but with a lot more ego and narcissism, where like he starts the rap career and stuff like that, and he's getting all the sponsors, which by the way, the rap career thing, I don't know if you know really much about it, but it's so much like just poking fun at Deion Sanders. Because I don't know if you know who Deion Sanders is. One of the greatest players who ever played the game. The, he came the, out in the rap. I, I'm aware of the name. I was not aware he did a rap album. The one thing I will say, the opening of this movie, even after we watch it now, I'm like, oh, is there a lot of this in it? Because it's very Oliver Stoney. The opening was sort of the um, the random, you know, sound bits and then the images superposed over each other. And then you get sort of like the um, the Native American sort of chanting and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, is this like the whole movie with the lightning flashes? And a, and it's really not. It's pretty much bookends the movie. I don't know. I think there, uh-huh. there are also plenty of moments. Like the beginning didn't bother me. The one time his sort of overheading kind of bothered me is in a really great back and forth between Jamie Foxx and Al Pacino when they go to – when he goes to Al Pacino's house – 
and they eat the jambalaya, and there's, oh, like, yeah. the back and forth that goes on there, and they cut to Ben Hur the whole time, just like, I get it. We own You're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the one that bothers me more. I don't mind it necessarily at the beginning, because it shows, it's just like, okay, this is, it fits where these people are trying to operate within the system of, like, football at this particular era, big professional football. So, of course, it's going to be a lot of, like, over-editing and jazzy stuff. It feels like so much like a late 90s movie in a way that makes it feel, like, authentic. Like, these are people who are struggling within that system. So, on a visual level, we have to, like, determine that. But at the same time, like, it doesn't feel like it overbears the movie. It's not like, along with this, I watched, finally, The Doors movie that, that he oh, did. Yeah. Um, oh, 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 that yeah. that movie is nothing but that. Only, unlike The Doors movie, uh, this is, like, much ado about something. As opposed to devoting right. two and a half fucking hours to the doors and Jim Morrison, just like, oh god, fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I had apathy for the doors before that. I had just pure contempt after that. Just like, oh god, who, <laughs> who fucking cares? Val Kilmer, you're too good for this. Anyway, also the other thing too, um, especially for a late '90s movie, this is a very subdued Pacino. Yeah, but like he's not crazy Pacino in this. Like, he's got a couple moments where he's yelling at the team and stuff, but that's basically it. The rest of it is it's really sort of a calm, understated performance. It's a good companion piece with the other big movie he did in 99, The Insider. Yes. I agree. Both similar performances. Also felt like kind of big watermarks for, like, Al Pacino maybe being like, this is me putting my all into it. Oh, I didn't get nominated for either of these performances? Fuck it. Just fuck it all. <laughs> I'm not caring. <laughs> and for a while he didn't. <laughs> That's true. I'd argue he still doesn't sometimes. But, uh, except for like an occasional like Irishman will pop up. And you're like, oh, right. wow. Right. Where were you this whole time? Just like, oh, I'm sorry. I was shooting uh, fucking Pacino. Righteous Kill or the <laughs> Jack and Jill or some bullshit. It also works for just Oliver Stone's style for also just shooting like the actual football sequences. Like in football movies, whenever they have football actually going around, you can kind of see the typical things just like, oh, it's like cut, reverse shot over from like everybody like hiking to the other opposing team looking at everybody. In this case, Oliver Stone goes wild in the way where it's like, no, you are there with these players. Oh, yeah. And it feels like you're getting like hit in the face and jumbled around. It feels like you're getting a concussion in a good way watching the movie. Or especially like my favorite example of that is when they're arguing with each other in the middle of that game where it's raining. And it just feels like everyone's, like, has fucking a waterfall pouring down them, but the camera's, like, perfectly dry at the same time. I love the way that particular point is shot. Oh, yeah, that was, that was absolutely great. And it's a great scene, too. It just goes to show, you know, that this fucking guy's ego and his, you know, sudden fame, the rest of his team are like, fuck you, man. And they just let him get obliterated in that game. Jamie Foxx. And he gets so bad, his helmet spins off, for God's sakes. Yeah. You know, and it's... It, it, Correct me if I'm wrong, that's also the scene that leads into him and LL Cool J get into a fight in the back. Right, yes, that, that also happens as well. Which Shadow also, I think this is probably LL Cool J's best performance in anything. Because it feels very 100%. authentic, especially to somebody who at that point was such a big, like, over-corporatized rapper at that point. He kind of played in perfect words. Like, the scene where he's arguing with uh, Cameron Diaz and Al Pacino about, like, look, if I'm not out there and I'm able to, like, get these particular touchdowns, I don't get my licensing deal with Nike or whatever, so then I get fucked over. Just like, hmm, is this acting from you, LL? This feels like this was based on a right. real experience. <laughs> oh, undoubtedly. Yeah, yeah. It is definitely his best performance. And then, do you notice fucking remake Leatherface? Oh yeah, I'm. I was like, hmm, the most prominent white guy who's like this big burly monster man who puts a fucking alligator in the middle of the shower. He's he's a lot of fun in this movie yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta take a shit. Oh, I'm gonna shit my pants. Oh god, yes, that scene. Another like <laughs> great use of like the chaotic energy of just like, oh my god, what's going on back here? People are getting diarrhea. People have their necks broken. It's and James was like, you're fine. No, you're fine. You can go out there. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> you, want me to stand, you want me to stand in front of the dream? Come on. What are you talking about? You know, who am I? Who am I to tell these guys they can't play? This is all they want to do. You're a doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fuck you. Go fuck yourself. You're like, oh, Jesus Man, Christ. you know. Yeah, I know we talked earlier about allegedly uh, James Woods being a piece of shit. Allegedly. Um, but at the same time, he was really fucking good at it. I love seeing James Woods completely dismiss the rightful concerns of protagonists. He's so good at it. He is such a perfect piece of shit in movies. He's the perfect guy you want to punch in the face. Allegedly. 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 But like, yeah, this, Casino, you know, any of those, we're like, oh, I hate this guy so much. Allegedly. 
<laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> like, to the point where one of his best performances is in, like, Hercules, where he plays fucking Hades, the lord of the underworld, which might feel appropriate. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. You say <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> yes. I want to point out specifically, we talked about him, we referenced him, but the whole thing with Lawrence Taylor as Shark... I, I was so compelled by. I, I've seen plenty of people do, like, concussion stories with football, especially post this. But it's so where you get, like, a player who is, like, it's so tragic where he wants to do it because he wants to get that million-dollar bonus and he wants to be able to, like, basically pay off his family for this whole time. And it feels so authentic in the way, once again, Lawrence Taylor, who was, like, in football, like, in the early 90s, right? He retired? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mix scandals and things like that but oh, oh like what, what are we talking drug. about oh, no, dr- drugs, oh okay. drugs okay like drugs. i guess yeah. um um allegedly um but no no that's not allegedly. oh no that's no, not allegedly. No, no, no. yeah lawrence taylor was definitely on crack and cocaine right there's no question about right it. but like so there feels like there's authentic worry and regret about this going on he's like really phenomenal in that bit where they like are telling him like look if you get hit the wrong way again you could like die you or at least get paralyzed horribly if you survive and he's just like, man, I gotta, I gotta go out there because that's what football has done to this man. Where he knows, like, after this, I can't do anything. That's all he's got. This is all he's got, all right? He's got. So you feel so invested to where when the end of the movie comes, and they have the final big game at what, what was it, the Pantheon Cup? It's a version yeah, of the yeah, Super yeah. Bowl, <laughs> which I love the work around for that. But when he ends up getting hit, you are genuinely like, oh fuck. What is going to happen here? It's a it's a moment that would feel so cliche in another sports movie, but here it feels like actual life and death stakes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other guy who I haven't mentioned him because I, I typically hate him, but he's really good in this, is Dennis Quaid. Yes! Dennis Quaid is fantastic in this movie. And the scene with him and Lauren Holly, it's devastating. Here they are in this mansion, and he's telling her, I shake all the time, I can barely feel my fingertips. I'm afraid if I get hit again, I'm done. Like, I might not be able to walk and blah, 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 blah. I'm saying now I can get out now. And she's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're a football player. And she slaps him. Right. And she says, like, are you going to be a quitter? Like, she calls him a fucking quitter about it and slaps him, which makes the later bit where he gets horribly, like, hit. And it looks like he's fucking, like, they're just missing the Tweety Birds around his head after he gets hit when he's just (laughs) looking around. And she's just like, oh, my God, I did this. I fucking put him out there. Yep. I feel like such a piece of shit. They create these scenarios where it just feels like it's so much about, like, the actual sport that's happening is, like, it's thrilling in the way of a sports movie, but you feel the consequence of what ultimately happens afterward. You feel so much, you're just like, oh, wait, these people have to live on after the big game that you see in these fucking big movies. They have to do that. Well, that's investing, while at the same time there are the fun uh, Oliver Stone touches, like, at that fucking final baseball game. Shit like the one guy losing an eye. And they have the overt, like, real close-ups on it. But more importantly, fucking Al Pacino does, like, a comedy double-take at it. Where he's like, blah, blah, blah. I know. know. Al Pacino, he does that a lot in this movie, though, if you notice. True, yes, there's just a lot of just... He's like, yeah! Oh, shit. (laughs) There's a lot of that. Because there's so much on the line for him, too. He knows he's he's done there. He's washed up. But then, the ultimate end of the movie. I like... You know that he's like, oh, I'm going to go on to this team now, blah, blah, blah. I do find it a little bit much. He's like, yeah, and I'm taking Willie Beeman with me. Like, that came across a little too much for me. See, that's interesting because I had a very reverse reaction to that where, like, that happens at the sort of midpoint of the credits. Like, the credits are going on as that's happening. Like, er, when this movie sort of, like, in theory, if I had gotten up out of the theater or stopped the movie at the point where, like, Willie B... Beeman and him are talking at the end of the game. It's just like, oh, hey, yeah, I was talking to some scout guys. And he looks over and Al Pacino's disappeared. That was the point where I'm just like, okay, this feels like a bit more sports cliche ending, whatever. And the press conference happens over the credits. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is like his swan song, I guess, whatever. That's fine. But it feels like it doesn't quite work for a movie that had that satirical bite for it to end on a bit more of like a sweet note. And then Al Pacino does that. And I'm like, oh, no, this fits fucking perfectly for this movie. Of course it does. I'm going to gracefully retire and I'm gone and goodbye, everybody. Psych, motherfuckers. I'm leaving and taking the best player with me. See you in the new season motherfuckers perfect that is exactly how i want this movie to end you might have swung me on that <laughs> um i i have two moments though that because this is definitely not a comedy but two moments that made me laugh out loud one is due to subtitles and the other one is a line in the movie the line in the movie is dennis quaid going i don't give a g whiz and it's like all right <laughs> i get you don't swear 
but gee whiz. <laughs> oh, Jiminy uh, Jilkers, guys. I can't believe this happened. The other one is like they're play- either practicing or playing their second game in the movie. And it's clearly playing Paranoid by Black Sabbath. Right. But the subtitle said Kid Rock's Ba Wata Ba. <laughs> I, I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> Which was really weird because it's like, look, I'm a southern white trash boy. Like, I'm aware of what that song sounds like. And this, sir, is not Ba Wit to Ba. I know Ba Wit to Ba. This is much better, whatever we're listening <laughs> Right, exactly. To. This is good music. How dare you? <laughs> I don't even know if Ba Wit to Ba was out yet. <laughs> oh, right. But uh, for me, a really funny moment I really liked is there's a bit early on where Al Pacino is trying to talk to Jamie Foxx about just like, now imagine the Buick. And he says the whole thing about like, imagine you're back at home in Texas and you're in the hood. His words, not mine. Um, and then yeah. during that sequence, I was talking about the Ben-Hur thing, right after all the cutting, it heads over to like Al Pacino talking, just like, oh, come on, you gotta listen to me. You've been talking at me all the time. You didn't even speak with me until that moment at the game. And then Jamie Foxx repeats the line and does a great Al Pacino <laughs> impression. <laughs> It's yep. genuinely really good and hilarious. I love that in movies. I'm a sucker for when somebody does an imitation of a guy who we know and is like famous for being imitated within the movie. It's so rare, and I love it in Jamie Foxx's case. It's kind of it shows his comedic chops as well at that time, and just how old school some of the thinking is. Like he's calling him out, like, hey, "Oh yeah, you in the hood." It's like, "Fuck you in the hood, you racist motherfucker!" Right? Like it was, it was really, really expertly done. I agree. Yeah, that awful jambalaya. <laughs> oh, later too, when they bring that back, because like, yep. remember when you had the jambalaya? Was that good? Oh, it's the worst thing I've ever fucking tasted. I figured that. I figured that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so good. I love that too. That also happens. Like I think not too long after that, when it's like the really tense moment, of like oh my god, we have four seconds left. They cut to the stands, and there's a fucking dude in a gorilla suit. And keep in mind, yeah. it's a game where it's the knights versus the sharks. And someone's dressed as a fucking gorilla. <laughs> Full-on gorilla comedy suit. <laughs> well, I mean, you gotta figure, though, there was always that guy at sports games back in the day who'd have a clown wig, a rainbow clown wig on with a John 316 sign. But he didn't go full ape suit. Like, that's hot. <laughs> that's really hot to wear the whole fucking game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I just, I love all the chaos that's happening there. I think that's the thing. It's like, Oliver Stone is one of those guys where, like, I'm so hot or cold. Do you either get, like, for me a Doors, or you get a Platoon, or you get a movie like this, where it feels like, no, this is totally appropriate for the movie that you're doing. This is right, the movie I believe, not right after, he did a couple movies in between, but you look at, like, this compared to even Natural Born Killers, and this is him using it perfectly, versus in that movie, I like that movie for what it is, but, um, I see why. it, it I goes see why. a bit I like- far at points. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Well, you know, Adam, we've been talking quite a bit about Any Given Sunday, so let's do some uh, final wrap-up thoughts here. Your final thoughts on Any Given Sunday. There's no other football movie really like it that goes in-depth to really what happens behind the scenes and really gives, you know, each main character a, t- a chance to breathe. Expertly written, expertly acted. I just think it's a super fun, dramatic, and fun, I know might sound like a bad way to describe it, but I enjoy watching this movie every time I've seen it. I, from the second it starts to the second it ends, I'm hooked. Um, I just think it's it's one of Oliver Stone's best, and it's definitely one of the best football movies I've ever seen, personally. Yeah, I would honestly agree with that. I think it's because it feels like it be very different from one of these movies, where so much of the time when you get a football movie, you know the steps, you know the cliches. You know, it's gonna be like, I remember the Titans or some other thing like that, where even if it involves like some bigger real world stuff beyond the actual game, it's going to be more about just sort of like the whole oh, big inspirational thing. A, a great example is like in this movie, how it subverts that a bit is the big inspirational speech that Pacino gives isn't the thing of like, we're going to like be the best there ever was. We're going to do this. It's about like, no, we are going inch by inch. Like, I'd heard that whole speech was great, and I agree, because it's not about going so full. We're just like, we're going to win. We're going to do it. We're the best team in the world. It's just like, we face a challenge at every single fucking inch, and we have to keep, like, just kind of pushing through. we got to plow through it. I know this, this team can do that. So many different personalities clashing, but we can do this on an inch-by-inch basis. That feels like the most honest, big, rousing sports speech you've ever heard. Because it feels like the most genuine of just like, look, this is what we got to fucking do. And we can do this if we can. I trust you enough to be able to do this much. Yeah, I agree. It's not like a win one for the Gipper or, you know, you're going to eat lightning and crap thunder. None of that crap. It's like, look, dude, 
we're going to get our asses beat this whole time, but as long as we can go inch by inch, we got a chance. Yeah, I, and I think that's like really the what perfectly summarizes the whole movie for me. Is it's really about at every single step, you are face so many challenges with football, not just on the field, but outside of the field, with the business side of it, with the just corporate sponsorship side of it, with funding it in that way, with just other just bullshit outside, like when you like go out into the world being a famous celebrity, like all the party scenes and shit like that, which are also fucking nuts. Like the big party scene that happens where like Andrew Bernarski's fucking some lady like on a table in the middle of the party and shit like that. Crazy shit. I guarantee you not entirely unrealistic yeah i wouldn't be surprised no. <laughs> yeah. no. i wouldn't be surprised allegedly in any of that allegedly. Oh, yes allegedly. <laughs> but uh, james woods is, uh, james woods is at all those parties in real life allegedly, extra- allegedly underlined three times allegedly um <laughs> but but no yeah i think great cast phenomenally good script one of the better oliver stone movies for sure yeah it's it's a so little weird movie that um so i'm glad exists because it feels like it could only also really happen in like 99 yeah you're not making this movie now no there's no way no the, inter- no. the nfl and professional sports are so fucking protected there's no way there's no way but before we get into our next film here's a promo for an eso show you can queue up right after ours if you were a monster kid growing up If you enjoyed Saturday mornings watching Monster Movie Matinee or staying up all night watching the Midnight Feature, then Monster Attack is the podcast for you. We not only look at classic old monster movies, we share our experience growing up as a monster kid. Join us every Monday for Monster Attack. All right, now let's get into our bad feature Jim Cotta. His name, Kurt Thomas. His title, three-time world gymnastics champion. His assignment, a secret mission for the United States government. His only weapon, himself. And that's all he needs. Combine the discipline, the timing, and the power of gymnastics with the explosive force of karate. And a new, all-powerful martial art is born. Jim Kata. When gymnastics and karate are fused, the combustion becomes an explosion. And a new kind of martial arts superhero is born. Jim Kata. So Jim Kata... Came out May third, nineteen eighty five. You know, wait a minute. Yes. Wait a minute. minute. The tone on your voice just then was perfect. So, (laughs) Jimkata. What thing? A a real thing that everyone knows about Jimkata. We've all studied Jimkata. You know, karate class. Move up to Jimkata. That's the next step. (laughs) Is Jimkata. This is directed by a guy named Robert Klaus who uh, we know as the director of Enter the Dragon. Fascinating. And then also Charles Robert Carner wrote this script based on the novel The Terrible Game by Dan Tyler Moore. But uh, Mr. Carner is the writer of a movie called Blind Fury, which um, yeah. is a movie we, we, we've we seen on like a movie night thing. We do movie night things outside of this, folks, in case you weren't aware. And Adam and I have watched uh, both Enter the Dragon and Blind Fury. And Blind Fury is definitely the one where um, that will come up on this show. That has to be. It has to. It must be. <laughs> but Jim Cotta was another one where we figured it would definitely be one we should cover because we love a good, bad movie. And this one at least has the big reputation of being an infamously sort of funny, bad movie where if you aren't aware, this came out in 1985 and stars a man named Kurt Thomas, who was not famous for being an actor. And no relation. No, no yes, no relation. Yes. To Adam, even though his great gymnast skills, you guys can't see. He's just doing... Like pummel horse things all the time on on camera. Yeah. I'm seeing him right now awesome. doing it. That's why my audio is so bad. <laughs> Constantly is. But um, Kurt Thomas, uh, who recently passed away actually last year, R.I.P. Mr. Thomas, uh, R.I.P. King, R.I.P. True King of Jim Cotta, um, was this guy who uh, had played in the Olympics, hadn't gotten any like sort of medals, I believe, as far as I'm, my research has shown, but was a three time gold medal winner for uh, the World Gymnastics Championships. And he competed in like 1976 for the Olympics. And he was also to do the 1980 Olympics, 
But the problem is, at that time, uh, we were boycotting the U.S., that is. We were boycotting the Olympics due to the um, the Soviet invasion of uh, Afghanistan, right? Correct. Yes. And so he couldn't participate in the Olympics, and he was considering waiting until 84, but he got so many offers and he needed the money to do stuff like commercials and um like gigs where he was a sports commentator started like a gymnastic school and a camp and also he was offered this film where (laughs) he plays um this guy who was a championship gymnastics guy as well jonathan cabot who also has a father who was a secret agent who has gone behind enemy lines in parmistan a name for the record that sounds like if someone wanted to be really shitty to Italians, they would call Italy Parmistan. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's what. That's, just, not well, that's true, yeah, behind my back. Or, no, right in front of my face. You usually <laughs> say it. Right like, Go back to Parmistan, you Italian motherfucker. Eat your cheese. Um, he has to go overseas to Parmistan to uh, participate in basically this thing that this country has called the game, which is a deadly game. That one has to basically participate in order to live behind enemy lines and also have one request. Which um, they are tasked to try and do this for basically getting the uh, ruler to uh, appreciate basically like her, his daughter, right? The princess? That's the request, yeah. isn't it? Right. Something like that. Right. Yeah. Who uh, Mr. Cabot and Princess Ribali, uh, played by Teshi Egbayani? Yeah, you know. Apologies. Apologies for fucking yeah. that yeah. name, ma'am. Um, but yeah, uh, they magically fall in love, uh, very quickly and awkwardly in this Very, movie. very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. Very quickly. In a very weird way. And they go over to Parmistan where they have to face off against not just people participating in the game, but also some people who are trying to basically screw over her father, the leader of the country. And also they have to go to the <laughs> town of crazies, <laughs> which we'll get into all of that. There's a lot of crazy stuff here. And so he is using a martial art that combines uh, karate with gymnastics. And so there's a lot of points where Kurt Thomas gets to show off his gymnastics skills, which if nothing else, whatever bad things we're about to say about this movie, it does at least show off the fact that Kurt Thomas was very talented as a gymnast. I agree. It feels like it's almost the only thing the movie has to pull out of its pocket to show, hey, this is good, right? Look at him. Uh, yep. <laughs> because, uh, hey, he's he's a weasel. <laughs> like, like, like with his mullet and his voice, he's a weasel. B, you mentioned like it, it's got the reputation it's so bad it's good. I would say it's about halfway there. I would say half of this movie is really fun and enjoyable, and the rest drags on for fucking ever. If you want to know exactly what part I'm talking about, uh, in the town of Crazies, when he slowly climbs up a wall in an alleyway, and you get a good three to five minutes of him making almost orgasmic moans and breathing, all in slow motion. I agree that I don't think it's quite consistent so bad it's a good movie, but it's a weird thing where, like, the consistent thing is, you'll watch the movie, and it will be, like, five minutes of kind of boredom, and then a really funny bad movement happens. Another five minutes of boredom, and then a real funny bad moment happens. So, like, if you made, like, an hour-long cut of this movie, it would be a perfect so bad's good gem. I agree with that. And the other thing about this movie, too, going in, only really kind of knowing what it is. It's Jim Cotta. He does gymnastics, karate, blah, blah, blah. I was aware of the pummel horse scene that happens later. That's about all I knew. Yeah, yeah. And, the like, the, the high bar scene in the middle of the alley, too. I was not aware of that. Crazy. That was a wonderful surprise. Oh, good. But... This movie takes so many weird turns where you're like, what the fuck is even happening at this point? Like that fucking lit ass party they have where there's fucking the one dude's throwing his size around. There's people sticking needles in their mouths, kids with like fucking flags waving them about. Like what is fucking going on? This movie feels like it was written on cocaine. Yes. But he's got to go to this town, right? And everybody's crazy. They all scream in through windows. And he's going to see a guy standing by the wall, right? And the guy doesn't really move, right? And then we zoom in on his face, and he turns around. He's got a face on the back <laughs> of his head. Face on... Well, we have to work up to the town of crazies, though, Adam. There's That's that's where I think this movie hits, like, its zenith of being a funny, bad movie. 
that's like the magic oh, 20 that. minutes of this movie is all out like oh perfect it ends on such a high note there um but before that even then despite how like i agree there's like a lot of boring stretches there's such a weird stuff even from like when they are like training him to like go out to parmistan where it's like he has two trainers one japanese guy and then this one burly black guy who for some reason has, has like a Clyde Steel horse. That's the black guy's like one animal that he has. And then the Japanese guy has a hawk who looks embarrassed to be there. The hawk is just like, oh, yeah. I need this money. Yeah. I need to leave. I'm going to fly out of here with my check. Yeah. Son of a bitch. Why am I at this? They're not shooting that Beastmaster sequel for a bit. I need to do this, I guess. Oh, there is a lot of running in this movie. Like, it's constant foot chases, this whole fucking movie. And also, very bright sweaters. Because, <laughs> you know, when you want to, like, be incognito in Parmistan, you want to chill, you want to wear, like, a big red sweater. That bright white pants. Right, what are those things on his shoulders? So they just, they look like there's, like, tracking marks. Are you about to do, like, motion capture? <laughs> what the fuck are those things on the side of you? Here, there, he's one of the guys who stands out on the runway with the fucking, <laughs> with the lights guiding planes down. Ex- except he doesn't need that's that, awesome. he just has his sweater. That's all he needs. Just yeah, he's like, got a sweater. Burp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the scene where they're in the, the little town shop area. Right, yes. And, like, him and the princess, and she's from that town. Right. Okay. But they're, but they're looking at every single thing like, oh, oh, isn't this wacky? Isn't this weird? Oh, oh. And then the one guy comes up and spits in his face. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's instantly like, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. Like, he just blowing cover right away. And my favorite part is the one just random CIA guy's like, hold on. No, this is, it's just a very hard time for Americans right now. But they'll die. Ah! He <laughs> <It's so laughs> <in the air. laughs> like, we, we joked about this at the top of the show. I can't emphasize enough how at least, like, 80% of the people who die in this movie die by, like, arrow. <laughs> like, either the back or the front of their chest. <laughs> yeah, easily. Sometimes multiple arrows, sometimes pinned to a wall by arrows. <laughs> it's just, it's insane. No, and, and the thing is, even, like, during that bizarre scene, there's also the thing where, like, the princess says her first lines. She hasn't spoken in the first, like, 25 minutes of this movie. And then at that point, she just says, like, oh, you don't see that every day, this particular thing at the bazaar. Like, what? Wasn't the whole point of your character you didn't speak yeah dude the guy she's promised to like her father's right hand man or whatever it's a mirror yes yeah with this blonde hair and beard and then this horribly fake braid in the back of his hand <laughs> yes what's interesting is that guy has a connection to our last week's episode um where he uh was also in mad max Fury road as like the right hand man of a morton joe the guy who's like bald has a bit of like beard at the at the bottom looks kind of like james cromwell that is him. Right. Uh, shout out Richard Norton is his name. He was a professional like stuntman, actor, and martial artist. Which was always confusing to me in Mad Max Fury Road. Why that guy had a beard. And right. nobody else did. Now I get it. It's just part of his face. Right. Yes. He can't get rid of that beard. No. <laughs> but, just, but just the whole idea of this movie to where they want to keep technology out of here. So they'd rather us live like we're still in the dark ages. Get the fuck out of here with this. It's the stupidest thing. Only so basically this town could become like one of the towns from the old Universal Monster movies. Where they just have like pitchforks yes. and shit. It's literally when it's just like they're stuck in that particular oh. era of history. Down to even their leader, the father, who I love. Like this this woman, clearly the, the princess is a, um, I apologize, some Asian descent. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I, I looked it up. I forget. It's like Filipino and something else. Right. Point is like her dad would not be the guy in this movie who looks like he's like from a Mel Brooks comedy. Yeah, it, I said that when he came on the screen. He's like, why is Mel Brooks in this movie? <laughs> Horrible, horrible <laughs> toupee. I mean, right. it's the worst. My wife's like, I think he's wearing a hat. I was like, technically he is. <laughs> like, well, I love that. Uh, there's that and also there's not much distinguishing between his uh, wig that you're referring to and also the weird like version of a czar hat that he wears. It looks like, did you like kill an animal and quickly like try and fashion it into a hat? Like, this looks like roadkill you turned into a fucking hat. Mm-hmm. So... This movie does the one thing that they do in action movies a lot, especially back in the day, like martial arts movies, to where the main guy will fight a group of people, but they'll only attack him one at a time. Oh, This, this might be the most egregious I've ever seen. Particularly the one where he, he's like cornered by the ninjas in the woods, and they're all yes. just like patiently waiting, like, okay, you go, Jim, all right, and now I'll go, and now Rick, you come after yeah. me. <laughs> the pommel horse scene. 
Yes, he's also. literally surrounded by fifty people with spears and pitchforks and shit, and they're just waiting their turn. And then he just kicks like the shit out of tw- like fifteen of them. He's like, "All right, time to run." <laughs> And then that's it. <laughs> and also, shout out to these ninjas who are like the henchmen. Especially those motherfuckers holding the flags are hilarious mm-hmm. to me. You see them constantly in the background where like, for the purpose of the game that they're playing, they have to have ninjas at certain like places. navigating their Right, navigating and also being kind of like refs to some degree. But even though, I can't emphasize enough to you how fucking funny it is whenever somebody runs by these guys in like the weird wrong direction is breaking the rules. And the ninja who is like holding the flag at any time just looks over and then he like slumps his shoulders and the flag falls down. He's like, Oh man, what are you fucking doing? <laughs> he just looks so bummed. I also love that the main guy tries to talk to like three of them and they're like, they're like Royal guard. They don't, they don't speak or nothing. And he's guys like, well, they're breaking the rules. Uh, which way should I go? God, I bet you didn't expect that. Did you? It just shows their eyes. And it's all clearly just white dudes. <laughs> like, you're like, you're like, this fucking so stupid. <laughs> Oh, it's the same shot over and over in this movie quite a few times. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, the same crowd shot, the same sound effects. Especially the punching and kicking sound effects are, like, virtually identical every time. And the dialogue fades in and out so bad. And that's the other thing I think, too. Like, the sound quality on this, at least the version we watched, was terrible for me. Oh, no, the yeah. picture quality and the sound quality. It's like no one gives a shit about preserving this movie. <laughs> one of the best examples of that is early on when he's talking with the CIA dude who's tasking him to be like you need to go out there and be Jim Cotta which by the way love the explanation scene when they cut back and forth how many times Kurt Thomas shifts in the shot it's just like oh he's really far back oh now he's off to the right now he's out of focus <laughs> Just yeah. so good. But when they're walking around later after that, like while he's training, just like, oh, you have to master this and this or something like that. Because I couldn't hear it since the leaves are so loud in that bit. The wind is literally blowing into the microphones. <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't even, they didn't even bother to go back and do ADR or not. That they're like, yeah, fuck it. It is what it is. No. And then it's like, he's trying to, like, I think him and the, I think him and the princess were trying to keep the fact that they were like, we're in love hidden, but the whole time they're in this town, especially at the dinner table, she's sitting right next to the fucking Beardo, they're just staring at each other. <laughs> it's not like even like in a huge romantic way, it's just almost like they're the village of the damn children, just looking straight <laughs> yeah. at each other. Which, I mean, that, that just speaks to the great chemistry, or even earlier on, one of my favorite bits we haven't talked about, which was clearly like a thing of, hey, Kurt, we have this scene written out where you talk to her, and she doesn't talk to you, so you kind of imitate her dialogue. Can you add gymnastics into that? Sure, and he, like, flips in between, like, oh, hey, Princess, how's it going? Doesn't respond. Okay, yep. I'm going to flip around and be like, oh, hi, I slept so wonderful last night. How did you flip? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. I'm all nimbly pimbly. Um, <laughs> That's the thing that charms her so much. She's like, oh, I'm in love with you now. And they kiss right after yep, yep. And then bet each other. Yep. And my favorite bit in the whole movie, I laughed so fucking there's two scenes so fucking hard one is when they first pull up on the boat to parmistan and the guy's waiting for him who ends up being like the double agent or whatever yeah and he has these two guys carry his giant ramp up to the boat so they can exit the boat is literally three inches away from the dock yep <laughs> like they could have just stepped off the boat and it's only the two of them with a bag each but he made them pull up this whole ramp situation like those guys probably were pissed and the other one is where he's fighting a guy, and he, like, flips on top of him. The back of his head is, like, right against the guy's crotch, and the guy's face is completely buried in his ass. <laughs> yeah. And he just lays there for like, a, for, like, a couple of seconds. So, you know, of course, I'm doing my own riff tracks, and the guy's like, is this, like, some weird 69 thing I don't know about? Like, I'm just going to lick your butt, you're going to headbutt my balls? <laughs> It was like, and he just lays there, and then he gets up, and they're clearly, that's one thing, too, I really liked about this movie. There's a couple scenes where they didn't cut quick enough, and you could see the reaction of the stunt guys. They lay on the ground, they're like, look at the camera. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot of awkward editing in this. Like, the bit from, like, that earlier thing I talked about with, like, the flipping around while talking to the princess. Like, they cut so awkwardly from the bit where he is being trained by the one Japanese guy to go up the stairs in a headstand thing. (laughs) Yes. And he's just like, the, the, he goes up the stairs on his headstand, just the guy's like, come on, come on, get up here. And he gets up there, and he's, that guy starts shaking Kurt Thomas' legs, like, yeah! And then it cuts to him walking up to the princess so awkwardly. And 
love when they show the Japanese guy, like, show his skill level. And he's got those two, like, bladed weapons, and he's just chopping at his own crotch the whole time. Also, the, the whole thing with the blindfold, he never has to do, Kirk Thomas. Never has to do that uh, at all. Uh, One of many things was, like, there's that and also the weird cue scene they have where they show him, like, oh, here's this gadget that shoots, like, a switchblade and all this other stuff. None of that ever comes back. Uh, ever. <laughs> ever. And also, if you're expecting blood from people getting shot, not going to happen. Not even with arrows. No, that's not going to happen. What you can expect is stuff like, we got to get to more specifically about the town of the crazies, Adam. Which earns the name. Yes, because there's this whole town where it's just like, oh, this is the banished part of the country that you can't go into. And it's just full of weird, bizarre, like horror, surreal sight gags. Like the guy with the two faces, which I just love because one, the face looks terrible. And two, Based on the implication that they're cannibals, the implication is that's just some guy's face that he put, like, on the back yep. of his face. <laughs> which well, is... You want to run into that guy without the monk summoning to the church. Right. When he turns around, a full shot of his hairy ass and balls. Well, specifically, like, he, from the front, it looks like he's wearing, like, a ceremonial monk hood. Right. And then it turns around, it's like, oh, is this actually... It's the twist is it's like a hospital gown. Because <laughs> you can see his full back, including his bare ass. <laughs> so, yes. And I'm like, what fuck is this <laughs> and then for a second the hero keeps going towards him and i'm like why would you follow him like what is happening here and, and also the median age of everybody in the town of crazies is like 55 <laughs> so he's just yep. kurt thomas who's like at this point 30 beating the shit out of old people <laughs> constantly <laughs> and women doesn't matter He's just pommel horsing the shit out of him. Right, and we should mention, we've talked about this pommel horsing the whole time. The whole setup for this is in the middle of, like, a courtyard in the town of Crazies is this little stone thing that has handles on it. And so yep. the only thing you could possibly think of is, like, oh, that's a pommel horse that you would use in gymnastics, which he later does use to, as we mentioned, kick the shit out of people. But I love, clearly a thing that was invented on the day was they're like, hmm, we have to make up some excuse for why there would be a pommel horse here. Um, oh, I know. Let's get that goat from the farm nearby and tie it up so it's like, oh, this is where people tie up their goats. Clearly. Yep. That's the logic. Yep. And there's some poor goat who looks once again like the hawk. She's like, oh, God, I gotta fire my agent. The hawk guy was right. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> oh, fuck me. Oh, God. What... Oh. I did King Lear. <laughs> I'm tired of doing this shit. <laughs> See, I love this too. Like, we were talking about this at the start of the episode. We're just like, I don't know if there's a lot to talk about. Adam, there is so much to talk about with Jim Cotton. Well, hold on. Though. There's a lot to talk about, is in we're talking about the dumb shit that happens. But as far as story and plot, there's none. No. There is literally none. <laughs> Absolutely zero. Call me an old fashioned guy. Even in bad movies, I like some kind of loose thing to follow. This has nothing. I love that his father all of a sudden shows up, too. Like, he's alive. Right. And also, like, if you were alive, stuck. why have you been in Parmistan this whole time and never tried to get out for, like, the months right. that you've been here? Oh, son, it's so good to see you. I love you. I can't wait to reconnect. Ah! <laughs> it gets an arrow to the back. And really, like, he carries back the guy on, like, the other horse's father. It's just like, is he alive? Is he not? What's going on here with this? I have no no idea. I, I agree that, like, sure, in, naturally I would like to have a plot and story or whatever. At the same time, with a bad movie like this, if it's consistently funny bad enough, I can be entertained by it. I do agree with you that it's just, like, these moments come after a long stretch to just, like, here's Kurt Thomas, like, right. running around. Here is, like, some exposition we don't really care about. Or explaining the rules of the game. Like, there's a point where one of the guys who's participating in the game gets shot. Um, or, like, falls down. Which, by the way... Great dummies, great terrible dummies mm. that fall in this fucking movie. I was just gonna say, my, one of the one of the things that's most consistent in this movie is the dummies that fall and hit the rocks. Oh, perfect, beautiful shots of those dummies falling. But um, there's a point where one guy like it gets like beaten by the ninjas and it's like finish him, and one of the ninjas shoots the other ninja who's holding the guy up, and it's like, oh, why did that happen? Oh, he broke the rules as well by trying to hunt down that guy who was being an asshole. Like what? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? That's what I'm saying. I don't know. I don't understand any of the rules of this. And then it's like, so he's climbing the rope, and they let the light. They they shoot the one guy with arrows who's climbing the rope, and then they light his rope on fire. How is that any different? Here's an important thing, Adam, because we like talking about you know funny bad movies. Yeah. We love talking about them all the time on the show. But you're saying that this one doesn't quite live up to the level. What separates this from something like say 
another movie that doesn't have much of a plot, but we were fascinated by it with like a fateful findings. That's a good question. Well, lack of Neil Breen is one. Well, I mean, that's a problem with any film that isn't Neil Breen. That's a problem with it. So all of cinema except for Neil Breen films are garbage because he's not there. <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess the thing about the Neil Breen film, which makes it so great, is it's one man doing all of it. And he clearly had some sort of agenda while making it. This one just feels like, we don't know what we're doing. Let's make a kung fu movie. You know, a more direct comparison is probably like one of our favorites early from the run of the show, Miami Connection. What do you think separates them, like, say, a Miami connection from this? That has a similar vibe, martial arts and all this other stuff. Dudes with their pants down and random towels for no reason. Right, another <laughs> reason most cinema fails. Good point, but that's not in there. <laughs> my father! My father! This message from my father! Right, and that, that guy isn't in there, so most of cinema is terrible because that no guy never acted. There's no dragon sound in this. Well, the dragon sound. If I could have a sincere answer to this question, I think I have, is that it's actually the adjective I just use, sincerity. This feels so much more yeah. like it is like from a cheap studio thing where this is like MGM getting the rights to like this book and turning it into this like cynical cash grab on like gymnastics craze as opposed to with Miami Connection that was like a bunch of sincere people making something they sincerely believed in. Even Neil Breen also has that though on a like cosmic other level that we're not even thinking of. Yeah, I <laughs> um, can, yeah right. You know, I suppose this movie you know what it's thinking of and you're like okay I'm a bit ahead of you on that but at least you can deliver. Consistent, fun, bad stuff. And it doesn't quite have that because you can see the shoddy sort of, like, lack of heart in it. I, I think you, you hit it right on the head. This was a total uh, grab, A, on the gymnastics craze, B, on the martial arts movie craze, especially the white martial arts guy craze. It's terrible. It's a terrible film. Like, there are a lot of funny shit. Like, I've had a lot of laughs talking to you about it tonight. But... Compared to, like, Faithful Foundings or Miami Connection or even one we haven't talked about on the show yet, like Dangerous Men, this isn't one I would recommend to anybody to watch. Unless I was with them and you could laugh about it together, but watching this on your own, it's a, kind of a chore. It was for me, anyways. It was a chore at points for me, yeah. I think there, it's sort of like in the level of, oh, fun, bad movies. This is like the B tier of those, I would say. Yeah, it's like the room, where there's a lot of funny shit in the room, but the room is a chore to get through. That's true. I think that they're more similar in, in that way, I would agree. But at the same time, even with like that lack of heart I was talking about, that sometimes results in some of the funniest things in this movie. Like, the bit where he's sure. running around in the red sweater, and there's a point where he just shows up in an alleyway, and, oh, look, there's a bar up there I can use to be able to flip around and people once again like these henchmen keep coming after him and get hit on the head one by one up until a random guy on a bicycle a bystander Bike. is kicked yeah. and my favorite thing about this is he gets kicked and Kurt Thomas is like oh my god are you okay and the guy's like oh god my head oh you're fine and he leaves that guy. Yeah, he leaves him I, I was so hoping that he would take the bike <laughs> like dude take his bike take his bike <laughs> oh oh lord well adam we've talked quite a lot about you Kata. so why don't we just brief final thoughts you're on the masterpiece of jim Kata. it's a terrible film there's a lot of funny shit in it like i said if you watch it with somebody who's into watching bad movies i think you'll have a good time but i do think it's definitely one of those movies that should be watched either with somebody or a group of people to really enjoy it. By yourself, it's kind of a chore. But if you could witness it, its lunacy with somebody else, I, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, yeah, I would generally agree with that. Um, it's it's the B tier of our like funny bad movie kind of thing, where if you watch it in a group, I agree, I think it would be a lot of fun. Um, but um, by yourself, watching it, there's a lot more lulls in there that don't quite work. There's lulls between the lulls, as the kids say. That's the thing, it just doesn't quite like, have the consistency to be, like, his consistently hysterically fun. Uh, but there are a lot of, like, peaks that are there, and a lot of just, like, low points where you're just kind of bored. So it's a bit of that in between, but the, the nuggets, the golden nuggets that show up are, like, so beautiful and so wonderful and so terrible in a way where, once again, this is just an oddity. It's I think I would recommend this to anybody, you nothing know, else because of how weird a singular object is. It's another movie where, much like Any Given Sunday... This could have only come out of, like, the mid-80s, where they felt like, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's, like, Fred Weintraub, the producer, literally saw Kurt Thomas in a commercial, and was just like, let's make a movie about that guy. Cast that guy as the lead of our fucking big movie. <laughs> yep, and you can tell. You indeed can tell. But, now, Adam, it's time we do our weekly segment, 
the double regia, where every week uh, you and I program um, the best and worst possible double feature uh, related to the topic that we're doing. So uh, you have two good and two bad movies related to sports movies, and I have the same to recommend and not recommend to some folks out there. And I'm going to be starting uh, with oh. my picks here. So uh, first, uh, we'll start off with... Um, actually, I'm going to start off with my bad, briefly, because um, I don't have as much to say about either of these movies. Um, but the first bad one I have is 2007's Blades of Glory, which was um, one of many attempts Will Ferrell had at doing the sports movie thing. I believe this... Wasn't this, like, the the third one? Because he did Caking and Screaming and then Talladega Nights. Yep, and then Semi-Pro. Was after was this, right. Movie. And I believe yeah. the last... Right? He didn't do another one. I actually, believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Um, unless you count um, Eurovision as a sport kind of later. Um, but but no. Uh, and it was basically, it was just him and John Heater, who was also popular, attempting to be popular, at least at the time after Napoleon Dynamite, um, them playing figure skaters. And there's a lot of, like, dumb homophobic jokes. There's a lot of stupid wastes of a lot of talent. Um, there's only a couple funny things. And I would say, like, particularly uh, Will Arnett and Amy Poehler which I believe this is around the time they had met each other before they got married, before eventually they got divorced. They're very funny as a pair of, like, brother and sister skating team who were implied to be incestuous, but particularly the bit where Will Ferrell and Will Arnett are chasing each other, initially on ice, and then they have to get into the building, so they're both on ice skates and keep, like, fucking falling over on each other and going up the escalator. That's the most hysterical thing about the movie. And otherwise, it's kind of like a forgettable, dumb sports comedy. Then, the other one I have is not a sports comedy, but is definitely trying to be a sincere sports drama. I think it's like the worst example of what we kind of talked about Any Given Sunday isn't, especially with football. I have The Blind Side. Yes, the movie that got Sandra Bullock her Oscar, which I think she deserved an Oscar at some point in her career. Maybe just not for that particular movie, which I remember at the time I was like you know in high school i was in suburbia where everyone loved that movie big massive successful movie that like warmed the hearts of everybody that 2009 holiday season extremely successful and even then i was just stunned because it's like this is like such a schmaltzy stupid movie that is also completely playing down to a real person's life with um i forgot the football player's name but he was actually this like black kid who not at all the guy they depict in this movie where he's like he has no sort of ability to like even read or function he's like so played down to be like really like stupid in this movie in a way that like baffles me in a way that even the football player the actual subjects are like no that's not at all what it fucking was like this is it's completely making up bullshit that i couldn't fucking read and all this other stuff it's incredibly like racist and stupid and it's just like the weird example of like just you know, the white savior complex movie within the context of football in a way that's just like really dumb, really bad. And it's a shame that it was as popular as it was. And hopefully it just gets completely forgotten by time. Or if not that, it's remembered as like, this is the wrong side of history. And this was dumb and stupid. This was such a popular movie. But my two good ones I'll go with here. First, The Color of Money, which is a Martin Scorsese movie that came out in 1986. And uh, was weirdly sort of the movie that he kind of cashed out on. Because this is a big budget sequel to a movie from the 60s called The Hustler. Which starred Paul Newman who returns here to play his character. Who in the original movie was uh, this pool shark sort of con artist guy. That would go around playing pool and hustling people and really getting like money out of folks who would... You know, be like, hey, you know what, why don't you play some pool with me, kid? Why don't you do this? Have a little bit of fun with me. In the 60s, he did that. And then in the 80s, he's retired from doing that, but is kind of scouting talent. when he be basically like a manager for another hustler. And he finds an interesting subject in the form of Tom Cruise, who was very young at the time. And the two uh, sort of go on a road trip thing where they play the long con. And there's some, like, tension between them, especially with uh, Tom Cruise's girlfriend, um, who, like, Paul Newman may or may not be kind of trying to attract. It's interesting uh, there. And it, I think it's definitely, like, lesser Scorsese, but it's still, like, a really fun, rousing movie. I think it's better than The Hustler, personally. And Paul Newman won his only competitive Oscar for the movie, and I get it, because Newman is so in the game of, like, you know what, I'm uh, a bit older now, but I still have, like, the ability to intimidate young-ass Tom Cruise, who's fresh off of, like, Top Gun 
in this fucking movie. And it's such a great back and forth with them. And there's a great scene also where um, Paul Newman has to face off against another, like, random scrub sort of hustler that comes up and actually bests him, who's played by baby-faced Forrest Whitaker. And it's such a good scene. And it's this really stellar movie, especially about a weird sport that doesn't get talked about a lot with pool. It's a really interesting, weird little sports movie I'd recommend to anybody. And then this is a movie that was very popular and especially played on cable a lot. And for some odd reason, I had never seen it in full until doing prep for this episode. My other good pick is A League of Their Own, which I had known a lot of the big moments in this movie, just like... There's no crying in baseball, or oh, Tom Hanks is peeing, or any of these other things that I flipped by on cable so many times. But I never sat down to watch the whole movie until this week. And I'll be goddamned if, like, this movie isn't just, like, oh, a movie nostalgically people remember because it's a really, like, played ubiquitously on cable so much. This movie is fucking great. I loved this movie, watching it the whole way through. It's a perfect comedy. It has such a stellar cast with, like, Gina Davis, Laurie Petty. Um, the best use of Madonna or Rosie O'Donnell in a movie. Tom Hanks, obviously, is so great. David Strathairn, uh, John Lovett showing up. Everyone is so awesome in this movie. Penny Marshall directs the hell out of it. It looks like a great authentic period movie, but also she plays the comedy and the drama so perfectly. And I get really invested by like the emotional big sweeping climax of this movie as well. Where I'm just like, I was like crying at the end of this movie. And I felt so invested in these women managing to find a place in the world that didn't look down on them, where they got to be like fun sports heroes. That's so dope. And it's so baffling to me that this movie that's kind of near perfect has one of the worst examples of dubbing in like a non-Godzilla US dub I've ever fucking seen. In these like book-ending segments where I older Gina Davis shows up and she's played by a different actress who, it's like, fine, she's like tall, and I get the basic thing of it, but they thought audiences wouldn't be able to get it, so they so poorly dubbed Gina Davis's voiceover. And it's baffling to me, because no one else is dubbed. Old Rosie O'Donnell just gets to be that actress's voice, and same thing like Old Madonna and everybody else, but they had to do that with Gina Davis, and it's just like, guys, we would have gotten it. Penny, everybody, we would have fucking gotten it. Why are you doing this and, like, making this almost perfect movie? begin and end on such a weird note it's so dumb because otherwise like i said that movie's pretty much fucking perfect blades of glory i agree there are a couple funny bits in it mostly it is will arnett and amy poehler like i really do like the bit you mentioned with them chasing each other inside on ice skates hilarious right or when they're talking about them and will arnett's like face down like on a polar bear rug and he's like these guys are a bunch of weirdos (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) so funny that but ultimately yeah it's it's a stupid fucking movie i've never seen the blind side mainly because of the reasons you mentioned near the end of your critique uh because i know none of it's really real and i have no interest in that like what is the point then and as far as your good ones i have seen color of money and the hustler i agree i think color of money is better and i also agree that paul newman absolutely deserved the oscar in that movie uh super fun movie yeah you don't get a lot of billiards movies but that, that's a really good one, and I agree it's maybe on the lesser end of Scorsese, but lesser end of Scorsese is still a damn good movie. Um, and A League of Their Own, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I think A League of Their Own is damn near a perfect movie. I, I don't understand the sort of post-hate it gets now. Like, a lot of people talk shit about it, or I can't believe you like that movie, blah. Have you seen it? Or are you just talking shit about it because it was on all the time? Even if it was on all the time and you've seen it 100 times, that doesn't make it a bad movie. It's still a really good movie. And you're a living example of that. Someone who's never seen it and goes back and watches it now and like, fuck, this movie's great. I could think of, this is now the second time I can think of an example for that for you. It was this and Ghost. Mm-hmm. Where you go back and you watch it and things were talked about it and you're like, dude, this was a really fucking good movie. Yeah, A League of Their Own is that good of a fucking movie. I completely agree. Hold on, before you get into yours, I did want to just comment. I forgot his name earlier. Michael Orr is the guy who was in The Blind Side. The, the focus of The Blind okay. Side. Who said it was all right, bullshit. Okay. So shout out to him and his admission that, yeah, that yeah. was all bullshit. I don't know why they did that. Yes, why? I mean, that's ridiculous. Okay, and so for my four... Uh, it's a four-way Costner, which could also be called my fantasy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. It's a Costner four-way. <laughs> so for my bad, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll do those first. I don't really have a lot to say about them. 
Uh, my first one is the Sam Raimi baseball movie, Detroit Tigers, for the love of the game. It looks okay. It's definitely a neutered Sam Raimi, and it's definitely just a boring movie. Like, it's directed by Sam Raimi, but if you'd have told me Kevin Costner directed that with his long-winded ass movies he does, I would have firmly believed you. Like, there would have been no question. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's just boring, dude. You know, it's a stereotypical sports movie, a guy at the end of his career, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, draft day, boring to me, uh, simply because I don't give a shit about football. And I think the whole mystique of the draft of people sitting around and watching it and partying for three days and really getting into it, it just boggles my mind. I, I just don't get it, and, and, you know, and, but I'm not a sports guy, so I, I don't think it is for me, this movie at all. And it, and it isn't. I find it really boring. There's some pretty good performances in it. Kevin Costner's good in it. It's just, I ultimately don't care about the subject material. So it, it just, it did nothing for me. And then for my two good one I have, which I think it's considered one of the greatest baseball movies ever made bull Durham with a uh, Costner Robbins and Sarandon. It's a great movie, man. Like it's, it's funnier than shit. There's some really good dramatic moments. There's some problematic language and stuff in it, but you know, uh, I think it's a super fun movie. It, it's really kind of cute in ways too. And it, I, I think it's kind of made me long for Kevin Costner to do a little bit more light comedy than he did. Um, and that's ultimately why my next choice is on there too. I have 10 cup with uh Costner and Cheech Marin and, uh, a couple other people just Kevin Costner plays like this, basically like a golf hustler. It, he's just really good at the game of golf. Like he can even shoot the ball like it's a you know a pool ball, and he's a drinker and he gambles on the ranges and stuff like that. He ultimately gets involved in uh, one of the main comp- golf championships, and it's sort of his story about it, it will he or will he not win and what his personal demons are and how to beat them and blah, blah, blah. And I just think it's a super fun movie. It's shot really well. It's acted really well. It's one that doesn't necessarily get a lot of talk about it uh, because I can see why people might not like it. But I, I, I think if you get a chance to see it, it, it's fun. You could definitely do worse, especially with a golf movie. I have technically seen only one of your movies with uh, For the Love of the Game, but I so barely remembered i just remembered being like on tbs or something and i just remember being very dull i might even be confusing it with some other fucking baseball movie but i just vaguely remember like a kevin costner baseball movie that sam raimi did i mean I it's could... possible costner did a couple of them I, I do not have a strong memory of that at least i don't even know if i can in good conscience say i've seen it technically um one of the raimi ones i don't have any real feeling toward um but yeah i haven't seen draft day bull durham or tin cup um, though I'd heard very good things about both Bull Durham and Tin Cup on that level. And the draft day thing, I generally agree with you, but I did at least have somebody explain that to me once who was like a football person who was just like, hey, what exactly is the appeal of watching the draft? And their whole thing was like, well, it's basically like hearing, oh, Steven Spielberg's making a new movie and they're casting everybody or like Dune as of very recently. It's yeah, just kind yeah, of like I finding out that. who are going to be the players in this, and it's just like, oh, we, I want to see how this goes, who the how the newcomers are going to do, how people who might have been traded over are going to work within this particular team, and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That could be appealing. Yeah, sure. So those are our double reduce choices, and we'll go ahead and repeat the titles here. I'll start uh, with uh, my two bad choices were The Blind Side and Blades of Glory, and my two good choices were The Color of Money and A League of Their Own. And my two bad choices were Draft Day and For the Love of the Game. And my good choices were Tin Cup and Bull Durham. Yes. Uh, so those were our double review choices. Please send your choices over to us on either our socials or, or email, which we'll share in a bit. But uh, we have uh, something else we want to do before we start getting out of here and uh, getting close to our picking for next week so stay tuned for that first though we just wanted to share uh, some feedback we got from people about our last episode uh, which was the reboots one where we had our guest Drew McWeeny on and we got a lot of nice positive feedback from people like Christian Alvarez says a fantastic episode about reboots uh, Eric Yvon says that was a fun episode Rafe Telsch says I'm so incredibly jealous great get for a guest and a fantastic dialogue about both the movies and so much more and James Rodriguez says an excellent episode covering one of the last decade's greatest films and one of its worst. Come for the magnificent discussions. Stay for a hilarious anecdote about Michael Bay. 
you know, you've posted about it on, on, on Twitter and I, I've shared your posts and even made a little blurb as well. Um, I, I agree. I, I think it's one of our better episodes ever in no way. Am I not giving most of that credit to Drew? Uh, yeah. I think Drew was a great guest, especially his little anecdotes and stories and having been there on the press circuit and had a little bit more inside information than we could possibly ever have. <laughs> yes. Uh, really, really great. I, I think, uh, to give you some credit, I think it's your best edited show. Oh, um, I yes. think it, it, I think it flows perfectly. And to give myself some credit, I made Drew laugh a couple times. So right, that's true. A very funny, insightful guy like Drew making him laugh is <laughs> like so perfect. Again, I've been I've been following that dude's work and listening to his podcast stuff for years as well. And it's uh, it was great having him. I'm still like we were both like in shock behind the curtain after we recorded that oh, episode, yeah. just like holy fuck, did that just, like, happen? And I listened back to that episode, I'm just like, I, I can't believe that fucking happened still. <laughs> it's so weird that happened. Hey, Rafe, suck a butt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, also, just a shout out, um, we got a lot of more people listening to that particular episode. If you stuck around after that episode and uh, kept going with, like, this one and hopefully more, uh, welcome aboard. Thanks for listening. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I kind of want to tie that into something, too. If you guys are new listeners and stuff, and, you know, a big day today for Disney Plus, uh, Shang-Chi, the new Marvel movie, has been released on Disney Plus and its new IMAX experience, if you guys want to watch that and everything. But if you join our Patreon, you can hear us talk about it right after it first came out. Our first thoughts on the uh, Edge Relevance a little special that we do quite frequently. Yes, on the Edge of Relevance on our Patreon. We'll talk a bit more about the Patreon as we go along here. Um, but we want to thank you all for those kind words about the episode and those of you listening. Also want to thank some other people like Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used in our show. Listen more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Christian Thor Lally for the artwork he provided for the show. Uh, follow him on at Night of Water. That's night with a K underscore of underscore water for uh, following him and all of his great stuff and follow the link tree. They'll have there on his Twitter, so you can see like his Instagram and stuff like that. And also thanks to our Patreon supporters. As Adam mentioned, you get access to like bonus podcasts and also get to vote for certain movies and topics we cover for just one dollar a month. And you know, there's a lot of stuff like the on the edge of relevance, as Adam mentioned, where we cover like newer movies that come out, but also audio commentaries and media discussions where we talk about like television or television, the show where we talk about uh television shows that Adam and I haven't seen before. Um the March Madness thing that's like three hours long is on there. Bunch of great audio content that that's just hours and hours that uh, only those who just pay one dollar get to listen to i mean and i'm being 100 percent honest here i don't know of a lot of other uh podcasts and shows that for just a dollar a month you get that much extra content that is a lot like you said hours and hours and hours we have recorded so much extra content and i love doing it for the patrons i absolutely love doing it for the edge lords i will continue to do it even if we go down to one person I will continue to get joy out of it. Oh, uh, but please stay, please. Uh, please. If you have the money, please yeah, no, stay, no, please, please. Stay, please. stay, stay. <laughs> Hey, Christmas is coming up. Christmas is coming up. Get it for somebody for again. <laughs> Very cheap gift for the loved one in your life. 12 bucks for a year. <laughs> Uh, well, for more of our own antics for free, you can follow us on at DEDB Pod on Twitter and Facebook, where we post a bunch of other stuff related to like the episode that we do, um, like posting videos and stuff, particularly on the Twitter and uh, images behind the scenes trivia things I find out. Um, and also, uh, you can e- either send us feedback there or send it to our email, doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com, all spelled out. And if you can't uh, contribute to the Patreon, that's cool. Um, you can help us out with just a one-time purchase uh, over at the ESOT Public Store. Uh, well, there will be a link in the description for that, along with the Patreon. Uh, but at the ESOT Public Store, you can buy a t-shirt or a mug or any sorts of other things with our logo on. And we get a bit of a kickback from that, and that, that would really help out if they did what? Buy our merch. Buy our merch. Yes. Make sure to do it and avoid people who are trying to stop you from buying with uh, your pummel horse. Just balance your laptop while you're trying to like, kick people in the face as you try and buy our merchandise. 
greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, you can find uh, me doing my own individual stuff on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterbox is at not the who's Tommy. And I also do some writing at marianithomas.wordpress.com and also at film-cred.com. And also just a shout out, um, I was recently on an episode of the Needless Things podcast, uh, which they released a recording of a panel I did back at Dragon Con in September, um, where uh, we talked about the werewolf films of 1981. So that includes An American Werewolf in London, The Howling, and Wolfen. Um, and there's some people on that panel who have been on the show before, friends of the show like Dave West and Nicole Cadaver. Uh, fun people, fun discussion that you can listen to over there on the Needless Things podcast. I'll probably have a link in the description for that as well. And you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Atom or Adam. That's A T O M underscore or underscore A D A M. And you can also find me on Letterboxd at Schwanson. That's S E H W A N D T S O N. I know that I should probably make it easy and have the same username for everyone, but I ain't paying for that pro account. So fuck you. If you aren't turned off by Adam directly saying go fuck yourself, uh, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and other <laughs> podcasting platforms. Uh, if you're listening, on ESO and not dig into all the other great shows on the network and uh, you can also dig into the archives on our Podbean main feed for a bunch of episodes we did even before we joined ESO and if nothing else if you can't support us on the Patreon or support us uh, by getting some merchandise that's cool uh, money can always be tight but the completely free way to assist us is to rate, review, or simply share the show around because that gets us more visibility and the algorithms and stuff on the Apple Podcasts and all that other stuff. It helps us out, gets more people exposed to Double H Double Bill. Yeah, and plus, you'd be super tight if you shared our shit around, you fucks. Su- super tight, like all the kids are still saying. So rad. <laughs> Radical. So Tubular, even. Bodacious, baby. Cowabunga. <laughs> Eat my shorts, man. Oh, no, no. This is 1990, so I am extremely offended by you saying that. This is the worst thing to happen to American society, is you saying, Eat my shorts. Yep. <laughs> I should be. Oh, I'm so banned. And you should have a bunch of really weird bootleg t shirts made of you. Um, well, on that very esoteric note, it's time to do our picking for next week's episode, where every week, Adam and I uh, have, you know, one has two good movies, one has two bad movies. Um, and uh, we assign a number between one and ten for each of the two choices we have. We switch up on the quality. So, uh, for example, I have the two good choices since I have the two bad for this week. Next week I'll have two good ones, and Adam is the same, and he has two bad ones. And uh, so we each have those two movies, and we get to pick numbers between one and ten for each of his choices. But keep in mind, there's this little thing here called the Godfather rule. Where uh, from now until May, Adam and I each have one veto in our back pocket. So we can hear the alternate person's choice from when we pick a number. And we can be like, hmm, I don't like that particular choice. So I'm going to say, actually, I'll take the cannoli. Thus, that one choice is out the window. And we have to go with whatever other choice is there. So, for example, Adam has his two bad choices. So I could be like, hmm, you know that bad choice he just said? I don't want to cover that one. I'll take the cannoli. And no matter whatever that choice is, I don't know. The other one, I have to go with that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for next week's episode, you know, uh, we did sports movies this time. And it's a Thanksgiving time. So what's also very common around Thanksgiving along with sports, but food. I was going to say, latent racism at dinner. Well, yeah, we're not, spoilers, we're not doing an episode on that the week after. Um, <laughs> but, but no, we're uh, doing food movies, uh, which was an interesting topic that was suggested by... The person we have planned to be the guest on the episode. Um, and it's interesting because food it can be very cinematic when it wants to be, when someone shoots it right. Oh, absolutely. So I got the two good ones. You got the two bad ones. So uh, you get to first pick number between one and ten for my two good choices. Okay. Since Thanksgiving's in November and I can't choose 11, I'm going to go number 10. Okay. Over at number nine, I had a movie I have had as an old option before. And is one uh, that is partially about an extremely famous chef and someone who is trying to imitate them. I have the 2009 Nora Ephron film, Julie and Julia. Oh, shit. I kind of knew this. I gotta be honest. I kind of figured this was going to be one of your choices. Do you want to take the cannoli on it, though? No, no, I'm not. Because I haven't seen it. And I've heard nothing but good things, especially from you. So, we'll go with it. 
All right. Well, over at number three, I had another one that I think I, I really enjoy. I think maybe a bit um, less discussed one, but from a great director. I have Ang Lee's Eat, Drink, Man, Woman. I've never even heard of that. It's a very cute little like dramedy about uh, people making food. Okay. I, I'll take your word for it. Now, Adam, your two bad choices. I am so curious as to what this okay. is going to be. Uh-huh. So, hmm. Fuck, I'm going to go with number eight. At number eight, on the dot, I have a movie I had never seen, right around the same year as Chef from John Favreau, which I also haven't seen, but I've heard good things about. Um, and I heard this is just a clusterfuck of a movie. It's the Bradley Cooper, Sienna Miller movie, Burnt. Hmm, Burnt. That is one I haven't seen. Um, but I remember it was weirdly very popular as like a script, and people were trying to make it, like so many weird productions. And people end up saying, oh, it wasn't that good. Um, you know, just for the synergy of having two movies about kind of famous chefs, I'll go ahead and say I won't take the cannoli on that. I won't take the fresh-baked cannoli this time. All right. And then my other choice I have, which is a, considered a horror classic, I, I've seen this movie a couple times, and I just don't get the appeal. I think it's just a bad movie. I have the stuff. What? Wow. Yeah, I don't like the stuff at all. I think there's a couple funny parts to it, but I think other than that, I think it's just a mess. I I really enjoy that one. Yeah, I love some Larry Cohen doing the, his satire about the food industry. I think that movie quite a bit. Well, well, that makes one of us. Yeah. But all right, so Burnt and Julie and Julia, two movies that actually uh, kind of fit together. But until next time, when we discuss those two films, everybody, uh, are you ready for some football? Uh, I mean... After that, no, I don't blame you for not being ready. I'm, I'm not a great sports announcer. No. has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the T Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.